Welcome to another edition of Teach the Geek Interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. Consider checking it out at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Today, my guest is Ed Quesenberry. He's a structural engineer who was an employee for years before striking on his, on his own and creating his own firm, Equilibrium Engineers, LLC. It's so easy to be an employee. You do your job, money ends up in your account every two weeks, and, 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 it's, and it's pretty predictable. So being an, an entrepreneur is another beast altogether. So I'm, I'm really interested to learn more about what prompted Ed to take the plunge into self-employment and also the ways in which public speaking has benefited him. Welcome to Teach the Geek Interviews, Ed. Thanks, Neil. Glad to be here. So, Ed, from the bit of research I did on you, I saw that you got a degree in architectural engineering. Where did that interest come from? Well, it, it kind of fell on my lap when I was in high school, honestly. Um, so it was my, I think my senior year and uh, thinking of starting to think about college plans. And, and I had taken uh, four years of um, drafting, uh, hand drafting as an elective in high school. And my, and my teacher, my drafting teacher uh, in class was just like, hey, you know, what are you thinking? What are you going to major in? Where do you think you're going to go? And I said, oh, well, I'm going to major in English and probably become a teacher or something. And he just kind of looked at me and he, he said, well, give me a second. And he came back with this course catalog from Cal Poly. It was a, a book that had like all the majors of Cal Poly listed out with descriptions. And, and he had one flag for me and it was architectural engineering. Cause he had seen me, I guess, you know, I had an affinity for drafting and design and, and math and, and he, was trying to point me that way. So I took it home, I read it and uh, it just, it really resonated with me. It was like, wow, this really sounds like a great combination of creativity and, and math and, and everything. And I applied, I got in amazingly enough and uh, that was it. It, it. And I, you know, I'm just one of those, I guess, lucky people that picked the right thing right out of the gate. Uh, I never even thought twice about changing my major once I got into it. and. Um, I uh, feel very fortunate that, you know, I had that kind of pivotal moment with that one, you know, influential mentor in my life very early on that kind of steered me that direction. So shout out to Mr. Meacham. All right. You know, it would be really interesting, Ed, if another student had told uh, Mr. Meacham when, when he was asked what, what you want to do after high school. Actually, I'd like to go into architectural engineering and, and become an architect, architectural engineer. And he brought him the same uh, course catalog and, and pointed to the English department. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been funny. That would have been funny. Yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This, uh, this Ed guy, yeah, architectural engineering for him. But you, yeah, maybe you become yeah. a teacher. <laughs> yeah, you don't realize how influential those those formative teachers are on your life, right? I mean... It's and and the special ones really that that take the the time and the care to to treat you as an individual, you know, and um, really look out for you. That would, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. So yeah, props Absolutely. to all the teachers out there. No question. So then, from also from from the bit of of I guess knowledge that I have, but it could be faulty knowledge. I always thought that structural engineers kind of came from civil engineering. Well, you have a degree in architectural engineering. So is it typical for people? With, with architectural engineering degrees to go into the structural engineering? Um, yeah, yeah, typically. So there's, there's a couple of paths um, academically to, to practicing structural engineering. The traditional path is through a civil engineering program, um, a bachelor's in civil engineering, uh, where you, it's pretty broad based. You get exposed to all aspects of civil engineering. So, you know, transportation, wastewater, um, whatever else. So, um, and structural. And then, in the last year or two, you specialize, you take more courses in whatever area of interest you are in, you have. So um, in, in this case, it would be structural engineering. So then you would graduate with a degree in civil engineering with a specialty in structures. Um, architectural engineering, there, there are only, I think there's probably less than 10, 10 or 12 programs nationally. Um, and it's a blend of it's kind of like the whole whole building um, education. So 
and, and the programs are not all the same. They don't have all the same curriculum. At Cal Poly, it was, it's really super focused on architecture and buildings. And uh, the, the RQ department is actually in the School of Architecture. And the first years we take courses with, with architecture students. So we're in doing, learning how to, you know, do renderings and, and create drawings. And, and we have get architectural um, history education um, and then after those first two years, we kind of split off from the architecture students and we um, study structures. So all the building material, design of building materials, uh, you know, concrete, steel, wood, um, all the basic mechanics and, and fundamentals of engineering. Um, so it's, um, it's kind of a unique program. Archie is a very unique program, um, but very super focused on, on typically on structural engineering. So I would say that most architectural engineers do end up practicing structural, although some actually may even do both, do architecture and structural engineering. Oh, okay. I was curious about that because, you know, you did say that you started off with the architects. So I was kind of curious to see if perhaps some architectural engineering graduates become architects themselves. So it sounds yes. like that does happen. Okay. So you, yeah, that does happen. Yeah. I know. I actually know a few that practice more on the architecture side than the engineering side, or they do both. They design and engineer the structures that they work on, so. Oh, wow. So, so that's it. That's interesting. So you're kind of, you could be a twofer, really. You could be, it's like you hire Yeah, about, okay. yeah, I learned, I learned pretty early on those first couple of years, I learned pretty early on. I don't have the chops to be a, an architect. Uh, that's, that's a, takes a part of the creative brain that I don't have. Um, uh, I'm more kind of inclined on the, the math and science side and uh but i still you know you still have to have a level of creativity in structural engineering um but yeah it was it, it became pretty evident in those first two years i don't have the graphic skills for uh to be to be a, an inspirational architect but um but i think i, I make a pretty decent structural engineer <laughs> out of curiosity do you notice any difference between those who end up as structural engineering that come from the architectural engineering background as opposed to the civil engineering background um, yeah, you know, my observations yeah, as a, as an RE grad and also as a, as an employer, um, and even as an employee when I started in the workforce, uh, you know, the I can speak specifically to the Cal Poly RE program. It's it really prepares students to uh, be a productive contributor at work on day one. I mean, you you come out of Cal Poly with um, design skills that that can be employed right away and uh whereas a civil grad in general it's because the program is so broad based they just don't have the the amount of courses behind them um so they do more uh you know on the job learning um and so i noticed that when i started out i i had kind of a leg up on civil grads um just because of the coursework that I'd been exposed to and the rigor that I had been put through at Cal Poly. And um, that kind of just set me, you know, on this trajectory, I was just a little bit ahead and I could, uh, you know, I got, I got bigger projects. I got more, more pieces of projects, larger pieces of projects right out of the gate. Um, so, so, you know, you know, I don't know about other RQ programs or I'm sure there's other civil programs out there that, that do a great job of preparing. But from my experience, um, yeah, the RQ, it, it really did prepare me well for work okay. right out of the gate. All right, I see. So then you get this degree and then it's time to, to get a job and start working. So I'm sure you did you know, structural engineering for a number of years. What did, how did the work that you do as an employee prepare you to start your own firm? Hmm, that's a good question, yeah. So, um, so there's a certain amount, you, you know, you enter in, you're, you're pretty low on the learning curve and there's a lot to structural engineering. There's, and, and uh, you know, there's building codes and we're dealing with, you know, multiple materials. So you have to be, you have to be skilled in the design nuances of each building material and know the, their limitations and their, ap their proper applications. And that takes time, that takes experience. So, you know, I spent the first, you know, 10 years uh, learning that, learning from mentors and, and learning by doing. And, uh, and then, uh, so I started out with a, a mid-sized firm, about 30 people, 30 engineers, and uh, great, great mentoring there. 
um, and really kind of honed my, uh, my skill. And then, then I moved to a large firm um, that has you know, multiple offices all over the US and very corporate environment. And I learned there the kind of more the business side of structural engineering. I was a manager or an associate with them and um, really learned you know, business development and um, uh, employee management, uh, mentoring myself. I was mentoring young engineers myself. So I learned, picked up all those skills. Uh, so through those two experiences, I, was, I felt like I was prepared. Um, and I just got to that point where it was like in my career where I was like, well, I could either do the corporate thing for the rest of my life or I could take a chance and, and launch out on my own. And uh, so I did, I took the leap. And, and I think, you know, I had by that time, I, I was 20, you know, 18, 20 years in, and I had really good background and experience. And, and it's, it's, it's been a really, really nice, really nice thing for me to, to create this firm. So. Nice. Well, okay. That's excellent. I, I was kind of curious about the name equilibrium. Is that, mm. does that have some sort of significance? And, mm. and if so, what is it? Yeah, it's, it's very intentional. Um, so it has multiple meanings. You know, when I've created the company, I, a lot of, a lot of engineering companies just use initials, you know, or last names of, uh, you know, call it Questenberry engineering or whatever. And I didn't want to do that. I wanted it to be something a little more enduring and, and general. Um, but equilibrium, and that's, that's, that's what we do as structural engineers, right? We, we're always uh, striving and, and maintaining, making sure that the structures we design are in equilibrium. Um, they don't fall over uh, and all the forces are resolved to the ground. Um, and, uh, and then the other aspect of it is, you know, um, working the corporate life. It, it's really, it, I found it difficult to balance um, personal and professional aspects of my life. Um, so I really wanted to get that equilibrium back in my life um, when I started my company. And I wanted to, to form the company in such a way that has a culture that allows that, at least allows that opportunity for equilibrium in all of my employees' lives as well. So, so we have a very family-related atmosphere. Um, sure, there are stressful times where that equilibrium gets out of whack and we're all working hard and not having too much fun, but we always seem to cycle back to um, some sort of state of balance there uh, and move forward. So yeah, it, it has multiple meanings um, and it's it's aspirational and it's also technical, so. Nice, I like that. So yeah. with the work that you do at Equilibrium, are there certain industries that you, you tend to work with or are you more, I guess, industry agnostic? <laughs> agnostic. Yeah, definitely agnostic. That's the secret to success uh, for a small firm like mine. Uh, we have to be diversified in, across all um, as many market sectors as we can, because in the event that a market sector um, tanks, like during a recession or during a pandemic, um, you know, uh, that could really sink a small firm like mine if we were, had all our eggs in one basket in say in healthcare during the pandemic, if we, if we had been all in healthcare, we probably wouldn't be around right now. Um, so yeah, we, we are in all market sectors. We do, you know, uh, housing, commercial, um, healthcare, uh, educational facilities, um, higher ed and, and K-12 stuff. And, uh, and it's served, it's served us well. That that business model has been really effective for us. We always seem to have work, and and it's varied. It's not we're not doing the same kind of building over and over again. It's there's always something new around the corner, and which keeps it fun and, and challenging for everybody. Nice. I actually, when you were talking, kind of got me thinking. You were saying that if you were if you focused on healthcare during this pandemic, then perhaps that would have been a, a, an issue. So, what industries were strong during the pandemic? Well, here in, uh, here in the Portland area in Oregon, um, affordable housing was really strong through here. We have a pretty significant uh, homeless problem here in, in Portland, and there's a big effort to, um, to build housing, permanent housing for these, these folks and, and give them a, a second chance. 
So there has been a lot of that kind of government subsidized housing uh, that kind of carried us through the pandemic. Um, that they're just building the, the demand for those units is it far exceeds the supply right now. And so there's um, they're, they're getting built all over the metro area. So apartment buildings essentially. Okay, cool. Yeah. Ed, Ed, I want to tell you a story. Okay. So here's a story time with Neil Thompson of Teach the Geek. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I love it. Wonderful. So this was my second job, Ed. And I took a job as a product development engineer at a medical device company. All my engineering degree uh, experience has been in medical devices. And I thought when I took the job, I was going to be a product development engineer. During the interview, they said this interview is for a product development engineering position. And I said, yes, that's what I want to be, mm -hmm. product development engineer. Because up until that point, I was a research associate doing a whole lot of work in a lab. And so this was going to be a step up in pay and also a step up in title. I like that. So I took the job as a product development engineer. But then a few months into the job, they said, we want you to be a project lead. And I said, oh, project lead? What does that mm -hmm. mean? The company was too cheap to hire project managers, Ed. And they pushed that responsibility onto the product development engineers. So now mm. not only would I have to be a product development engineer, I'd have to take on the responsibilities of a project manager, one of which was giving presentations in front of management. I had to do that every month. Mm -hmm. And we're talking the CEO, the CTO, the CMO, the C fill in the blank O. All these people <laughs> were in the audience looking at me give this presentation. Let me tell you, Ed, those first few presentations that I did were absolutely horrendous. I didn't know it was possible to sweat that profusely from one's body. And you would have thought that after the first one, when I completely wet the bed, I would have gotten better for the second. But no, Ed, I didn't. It, didn't it, it, it took numerous attempts at giving these presentations for me to see the benefit of me getting better at presenting in front of people. So I'm curious, Ed, during your career, when, did you, when was that aha moment for you when you saw the benefit of getting better at presenting in front of others? Mm. What was that moment? Um, you know, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm again lucky. I guess uh, compared to you, uh, I've always been had some sort of level of comfort with being up in front of people. I, I don't know. I just, I don't. It doesn't stress me out too much. Um, I was in drama in high school. I was in school plays. I, you know, I, I don't. So. Um, that doesn't mean that, you know, I haven't had instances where I've been up in front of people and been nervous. I, I still get nervous. Um, but, you know, I, um, I've also, you know, I, like I said, I was almost an English major. Uh, I've always enjoyed the written word. I, I've, I enjoy writing um, and creating, using words to, uh, to express myself um, accurately and, in a way that is relatable. And so, I don't know, between, between just not ever feeling totally stage fright and then just being comfortable with writing and, 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 and saying those words out loud, um, I, I don't know if I have, but had to have an exact aha moment. Um, but I do know, I mean, I do hear you and there's a lot of people that struggle with this and uh, it is a very important skill to have. Um, and it's, and for many, it's something you just have to gut through and learn and just do it like you did, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's just one of those things, but, but you got to be able to express yourself. You got to be able to, um, in, in a leadership position, especially you have to have that ability to inspire and relate to people verbally and, um, and uh, so you got to kind of do what it takes, you know, yeah, every one of us has to, to do what it takes that, you know, you had to take probably take some courses or, um, you know, do something like that. I've been through, I did a, a round at Toastmasters, uh, just kind of to help try to hone my skills. And I found that very educational. So that's, I don't know if you've done that, but you know, it's, it's, that's a good, it's a good program for, for those that are maybe, you know, reticent to get up in front of people. Wow. I bet people that are listening or, or watching this and struggle with public speaking, hearing you say, you know, it was never really a big issue with me. <laughs> yeah, they just, they just clicked uh, hang up, you know, yeah, we're okay. not going to listen to this guy. This guy. <laughs> you know, learn anything from this guy. <laughs> <laughs> you, you struggle with this guy, it kind of sucks for you. <laughs> yeah. 
sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to the presentations that, that you do, Ed, do you have a process for putting them together? And if so, what is it? Um, yeah, you know, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a, th a big theme guy. So I think that anytime you get up in front of people and, you're, and, you, and you have a, a presentation or a speech or something, there's got to be some sort of a theme, uh, a, a message you want to get across. And so I spent a lot of time figuring out what that message is. And, um, and then I craft my, my words around that so that I can um, express it accurately in the way, in the way that I want to. Um, and also, you know, a lot of times, sometimes if it's, uh, if it's more of a motivational thing or a, um, I'm trying to get, trying to elicit some sort of outcome, I'll end with a, a call to action, right? I'll, I'll ask people to, to do something, um, to get involved or whatever it is. And so then I figure out the word, the right words to kind of elicit the response that I want to get from the audience, right? And so, so it's, it's, an, it's an intentional process, um, but it's, you know, it, that's, I would say, you know, theme and then a call to action if, if, if it's appropriate. Um, and then I just build from there. Nice. You know, it, it, this is all kind of making sense. I mean, you did think, you did at one point think you were going to be an English major. So the idea that <laughs> words would be important to you, that kind of makes sense. And I really like your idea of, of really thinking about what the theme is going to be beforehand. I can tell you when I first started giving those presentations in front of management, all I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't do a whole lot of thinking. It, I would just put some stuff on slides, get up there, read them, and try to get out of there as quickly as possible. But Ed, yeah. I, I never got out of there as quickly as possible. It was, always, <laughs> it was a painful experience, at least initially, because oftentimes what would happen is I would have to answer questions that I thought I had answered during the presentation. But because I put it in such a way that these people could understand, now yeah. I'm sweating even more. I was sweating already during the damn presentation. Now during this Q and A, it's like now it's really pouring, and it's, yeah. just, it's just a waste yeah. of time for everybody involved. And I, eventually, I learned my lesson. But you didn't have to learn. Someone like Ed, he didn't have to learn a lesson because he was good at it from from the jump. So <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, you know, I have learned stuff. Like uh, I was at this one uh, seminar on on public speaking, and it was. Uh, the, the person said that PowerPoint was the uh, worst invention uh, known to mankind as far as, you know, communications goes, because, you know, that's the tendency with PowerPoint. You go in there, you just create a bunch of bullet points, put a bunch of words on a slide and, and you pop it up on the screen and immediately people's minds just shut off and they don't listen to you. They're reading either reading what's on the thing or they're just logged out. Um, and so I, you know, when I, if I ever use slides now, I, mean, I used to do the same thing, load them up with power, with, with bullet points. And um, that way, I mean, all the talking points are there. I'm not going to forget anything. It's going to be great. But then I lost, I would lose my audience. So, so I really think about that, you know, use, use images, use pictures, use emojis, whatever it is, or keywords, but just don't put, you know, a hundred words on a slide and expect you're going to be able to engage with your audience. So yeah. that was one, one big tip I learned. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree with you there, Ed. When you're absolutely right, when you put a whole bunch of words on the on the slide, the person's presenting, they're going to read them, and the pe people that are on the in the audience, they're likely to read them too. And when that happens, then you're it, it's public reading, not not public speaking, <laughs> or or public sleeping. Oh, that too. <laughs> well, at least in the case where if you're reading, you're not looking up at your audience, you may very well not even know that some of them fall asleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I agree with you. I think it's, it's best to try to minimize the, the number of words on the slide because it, then you, you're, you're not, as the presenter, you're not going to be tempted to read because there's nothing really to read. And then the people in the audience, they are not going to read either. So now either they're going to listen or they're going to ignore you. You've eliminated that the option of them reading it. So now you have, a, you have a one in two chance of them listening as opposed to one in three. I like yep. those odds better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, this has been great talking to you, Ed. Thank you so much for being a guest. How can people get in touch with you? Um, well, you can uh, check out uh, our website, equilibriumllc.com. Uh, and uh, there's contact page on there. You can reach out to me, um, edq at equilibriumllc.com. 
Uh, and if you're ever in, uh, if you're ever in the Portland metro area, stop by, say hi. Excellent. Well, everybody, that marks the end of another edition of Teach the Geek interviews. My name is Neil Thompson. I'm the founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. Consider checking it out at teachthegeek.com. Again, that's teachthegeek.com. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Neil.